This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Stephen Asma, who is a professor of philosophy at Columbia College in Chicago. He's also the head of their Center for Mind Science. Actually, I can't remember what it is. What? Mind, <laughs> science, and culture. <laughs> Mind, science, and culture, right. Um, he is also the author of uh, a whole bunch of books, I think seven books by now, of which Ten. I have, I think I have five here. Uh, most recently co-authored this book called The, the Emotional Mind, which is uh, really a, um, gosh, it's, it's a comprehensive survey of uh, kind of a new way of, of thinking about uh, mind and the emotions, right? Um, building on, I guess, your mentor, Jan uh, or Jan Skeep, Penskeep, Jan Penskeep's work. Jan Penskeep, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've actually, I actually have a couple of his books. Uh, uh, f- I guess he's, he's, he's no longer with us. And um, also books, uh, Why We Need Religion, um, Against Fairness. Okay, that's, that's going to be one that's, I, I think, you know, provocative. <laughs> the Evolution of Imagination on Monsters uh, and a couple others. He's also a um, blues musician. And uh, a visual artist, and also an expert on on Buddhism, and uh, spent a lot of time in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and other countries. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you also buying all the books, Gregory. That's a, <laughs> kind of remarkable. I could have sent you some of them, but thank you. Hey, so, I got I got I got to keep uh, you know got to got to give you the few nickels that come from each, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. each book sale. <laughs> But, um, but look, Stephen, you, you know, you're, you're really embarking on a very interesting project. Um, and I, I don't know even if there is a name for what it is that you're, you're doing. I, I think I, I came up with this idea of uh, somewhere affective neuro philosophy, maybe, because it sits at the intersection of uh, philosophy, uh, psychology, uh, you know, religion, study of the emotions, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're discussing stories and, and storytelling there's so many different disciplines that converge on what it is that you're doing, but I think you're really trying to understand humans and you're trying to understand them in a, in a way that is, is I guess, richer uh, and more comprehensive than the paradigm that we see in, I guess, contemporary philosophy, contemporary psychology, uh, com- contemporary decision theory. And, and, and there's sort of a, I guess a positive and, and a normative dimension to this because mm-hmm. the contemporary decision theorists, they emphasize this division between kind of system one and system two thinking. And, and it seems that all, all of the problems <laughs> can be a, attributed to, to kind of system one and, and, and philosophers have traditionally devalued the role of, of emotions and, uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, scientists have sort of devalued the role of, of religion. And so in, in some sense, what you're doing is you're, you're standing up for emotion, you're standing up for hot reasoning, you're standing up for uh, religions and affect. Uh, and that's a pretty big agenda. So um, it's very ambitious. So tell, tell me a bit about, um, you know, how did you come to see the importance of these different levels of, of cognition? And how did you come to see the oversight that uh, prevails in so many of the disciplines that you touch on. Yeah. I mean, it's the way you framed it is really nice. I think that's, that's about right. And I, I suppose um, my, my, it started because my PhD is in philosophy. And um, when I was being trained in philosophy, my orientation was towards philosophy of science. And at that time, the only people doing philosophy of science were people doing uh, philosophy of physics and slowly what started to emerge was um, interest in biology. And I always had a longstanding interest in biology. So my actual degree was in um, the philosophy of biology. And what I discovered in doing that degree was that philosophers are, you know, your show's unsiloed. Philosophers are in a silo. They're an extremely insular group. They really, um, not all of them, but as a field, it's kind of remarkable how isolated they are on a handful of perennial questions. And I found that, that the philosophers I would talk to didn't know much biology. 
and discounted its importance and didn't think it was very interesting. And then I would talk to biologists and they were sort of focused on micro questions. I mean, literally micro questions. And a lot of them didn't even seem to know basic stuff about evolution theory, which seemed criminal to me since it's the foundation of, of modern biology. And so it seemed like we were sort of talking at cross purposes. And in the humanities, and I think you're right, even in the social sciences now with decision theory, there's an emphasis on this, what I would call, I'll follow your metaphor, which is sort of a top layer of this cake and, you know, or, or you know, geogra geological strata or, or whatever. And so they're looking at what's the decision making brain doing or mind. And that's a very linguistic mind and it's very heavily enculturated. And they're ignoring everything down below that level of mind. And then the biologists are sort of focusing on, you know, these sort of instinctual springs of action, you know, uh, that we share with other mammals. And there's no meeting in the middle. Like they're, they're literally uh, talking different languages. And now, because of the culture wars that we're in now, they're actually increasingly hostile towards each other. And so my whole project has been to try to weave together, you know, the, the different layers and show that there are causal influences from the emotions below, from the body, to how we think and our language and our storytelling, just as there are also top-down influences on, on how we structure the emotions. And that's what, many, in many ways, religion and other cultural um sort of techniques and technologies are trying to do is sort of manage the physiology of the body. So yeah, that's maybe that's a good place to start. That's sort of where I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to balance or find that middle connection. Before we continue, is there a way to move your, get a little microphone a little closer to yeah. where you are so we can Let me try and get, get it. A, little, a little louder. Okay. I'm, um, that's a quite a bit closer. Let me know if that's any better. Okay. For some reason you seem a little seem a little faint. I didn't mean to interrupt. I can the, actually the, lean right into it. I just got to remember to lean into it. How's yeah, that? I don't know why it's so faint. Anyway, um, maybe it's just a volume issue on your side, but it's okay. Maybe um, can, we can just crank okay, it I'm up. turning it up a little the, bit on the dial. Yeah. I don't know if that's helping at all. How's that? Okay. No, it'll do. I can, I can hear you. <laughs> that's all that matters. All right, okay. let's, let's, let's stop. So, so I think you, you introduced this concept of the kind of uh, tripartite mind to some degree. I, mean, I don't know whether mind is the right term, but tripartite uh, kind of cognitive system. And, and you also even use this term, the archaeology of, of consciousness, right? Presumably because the, the different layers that you're describing were, were kind of, you know, they, they started with, you know, the subcortical brain is, is, is something which goes way, way back. And then you have sort of the, the, the limbic system, and then you have the you know, the, the neocortex. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we're, we're not just sort of living on the, on the surface, but, but it seems like, I, I guess artificial intelligence has, um, I don't know whether it's influenced or I don't know if it's a cause or a consequence of a, a way of, of looking at the mind as sort of a, a, a comp computational system, right? Is, is, I mean, of course, it makes sense to to emphasize that aspect of 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 the mind because we're we're seeing such rapid developments in in artificial intelligence. But but is there a reason why we've 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 emphasized that that aspect of the, of the mind exclusively, besides the fact that it's you know so important to artificial intelligence? I, I think it is a little bit like the way in which. Um you know, behaviorism came to dominate psychology in part because you could just observe the behavior better than you could postulate, you know, inner workings of a subjective consciousness. So in a sense, the the technique or the technology tilted us towards, um, you know, or the ease of observation tilted us towards behaviorism. I think in, in cont contemporary AI, the computer model models are tilting us towards a certain kind of cognition, which is this, I would consider it to be a very rarefied, unique kind of a calculation that not only are human beings doing this primarily as opposed to the other animals, but I would argue that most human beings are only rarely engaging in this kind of computational consciousness of sort of chess playing mind. But the, the, pro, the reason why we look at it this way is because these computational, well, computers, 
were based on the sentential logic that was devised by people like Bertrand Russell and the people coming out of the, the Vienna circle who thought you could take propositions and you could basically translate those propositions into logical functors like and, or, and then you have variables. And that lent itself beautifully to the, the early computational languages. So all of, you know, like a Google search is basically like a, a Boolean algebra problem that's done very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So there, that's why I think we went in this direction. But that, I think, has, has caused us to go down the primrose path to looking at it only a kind of mind that um, solves problems in this symbolic way using propositional language and it forgets about the rest of the mind like you were saying if we think about the mind archaeologically that that sort of calculator mind is isn't even on the scene until in terms of evolution it wouldn't have emerged until around the time of language which is arguably could be a million years old could only be like a hundred thousand years old we don't exactly know when language emerged think about how short a, a or what a narrow sort of strata that is compared to uh, the way in which animals solve problems and the way in which animals are smart. And as mammals, we have uh, operating systems that are below, like in the limbic system, in the subcortical regions, that are designed to solve problems of survival and resource management that are not these calculation propositional systems. So I think, uh, and I was laughing, this guy recently was a Google employee. I know you know this story. And he said he thought one of these chat bots had become sentient yeah. or conscious. And then I think Google let him go or <laughs> something. Mm -hmm. But what, what cracks me up about that is, um, is that our marker of sentience is actually how well you use language, which I think is a ridiculous marker of what what a mind is and what sentience is. So I have been influenced by people like Yak Pangsep and Antonio Damasio and people who look at the emotional brain, which is much older, much and a much bigger part of our consciousness. Right, but but let's suppose that we were to acknowledge that. Um... This is an inadequate description of how people think. It's an inadequate description of, it's inadequate to explain how people behave. Wouldn't people still say, well, yes, but normatively, right, we should lean more heavily on our rational capacities. In fact, that, you know, that, that neocortex is what makes us human. And, you know, after all, we're interested in being human. We, we don't want to be worms. We don't want to be, you know, primates and, and so forth. So why, why can't we... Normatively, whenever there is a choice between using these higher cognitive capacities and relying on sort of a, a lower or more primitive cognitive capacity, emphasize the, the former. It's a good question. And I think uh, I don't want to suggest that we should never turn to reason. I mean, it's to, we have it for uh, as a great power and it has created uh, amazing things uh, on the other. And so in cases like the law, it does seem to mm -hmm. me fairly obvious that one wants to use something like a, a sort of ideal of disembodied rationality for for normative fairness. Um, and we have a whole tradition uh, about this, and it seems to work very well. My arg The argument in many, many of my own sort of books and projects is that that calculus uh, doesn't work well for large parts of the human experience. For example, what is, you know, American democracy is sort of built on notions of um, that come out of the liberal tradition like John Stuart Mill and Bentham and the idea of a kind of utilitarian logic where you're trying to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number. That's a rational calculus. I mean, it, it's a called a calculus, calculus of hedons, a hedonic calculus. And that works for certain kinds of social problems. When you have huge societies of strangers, that's a great system. The problem is if you try to plug in your actual values and your loyalties and allegiances to this system, it doesn't work very well. And you end up with some strange results like uh, most of us um, are very dedicated to our loved ones, our family first. Uh, so we have high levels of loyalty f to family members, kith and kin. Um, and if you say to me, well, you know, as some utilitarians did, you know, if you're trying to maximize the greatest good for a number, uh, for the greatest number, then you may have to actually 
hurt a family member in order for larger numbers of people mm -hmm. to actually benefit. There's a f fairly uh, interesting uh, utilitarian thought experiment by, I think it's Sedgwick, who says, you know, you go into this burning building, you, you can only save one person. And you look and you see, you know, he, the example he gave was this very famous and powerful politician who's going to do a lot of good for the society. So maybe you put your favorite politician in the corner and then you look over and you see the chambermaid. And uh, he's well, like, that, one, that one's older than that, right? That goes back to some bishop, right? That was in, in the burning building. Yeah, it's it. it the, the one I'm thinking of is from the 1700s, but maybe there's one even earlier than that that I don't know. But in it, the choice is like the chambermaid versus this person. And the utilitarian utilitarian calculus is, yeah, go with the great politician rather than the chambermaid. But then if I if I if you look closer and you see, oh, wait, the chambermaid is my mother. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, the calculus to my mind, the calculus is 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 over. <laughs> it's just done like you just saved your mother. Um, and we, we don't have a way in ethics and in the normative rational systems to uh, describe that as anything but a kind of uh, failure of ethics, mm -hmm. a kind of unfortunate nepotism, you know, and isn't that awful, but we're just broken like that. And I just, I, I want to reclaim uh, loyalty as a kind of normative system. Uh, and it, the, the issue then is how do you connect the sort of filial piety, what's mm -hmm. sometimes called now like tribalism to the larger uh, utilitarian rational liberal tradition and that's really tricky so that's an area i'm interested in well i mean that that's an that's that basically acknowledges that there are competing ends right that there are different goods that are in conflict necessarily in conflict right so yes the the virtue of of loyalty or the virtue of filial piety is ultimately going to be in conflict with your kind of you know utilitarian fairness or your utilitarian impulse right yes and i i guess there are traditions that recognize this uh contest of values uh i i was i've always been very influenced by isaiah berlin but there's mm -hmm. other traditions who seem to to think that no it's all going to smooth out together in a kind of utopian uh harmony at some point and that's i guess the the view that i'm that seems to be dominant and that i'm kind of irritated by well, I mean, that, that in the argument that you're describing is the one that is at the center of the book against fairness. And, and I think, you know, this is a bit troubling for most people in at least um, the American context, right? Because we stand against things like nepotism and corruption and so forth. And, and you contrast this with the East Asian culture where your first duty is to your family and to your, your kin and so forth. So, um, you know, I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about that because um, I think most most Americans would, on on the one hand, be very upset if you engage in acts of nepotism, but on the other hand, I think there's a degree to which, without explicitly acknowledging it, we would be upset if we were not given some kind of preference by our our relatives. You know, Peter Singer is famous for having this very, very strict utilitarian viewpoint, which requires you to help the least fortunate, even if it means substantial sacrifice on your part. And actually, when I found out that he was spending a huge amount of money to keep his mother in <laughs> a retirement home, it, it actually, I actually, I actually liked him a whole lot better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, I kind of like this guy now, right? Yeah. <laughs> because he is, he is seemingly inconsistent and hypocritical in that way, right? I, I agree with you, actually. That, that humanizes him a bit to me as well. And he famously works with uh, uh, a guy named Zell Kravinsky, who made a fortune on real estate. And then I think there was a time when Singer and Zell Kravinsky were sort of touring around, sort of like a pro-utilitarian tour of some kind. And Kravinsky said, like, 
You know, he'd given his kidney to a stranger who needed it. And he said, I'm willing to give my other kidney if, if it's going to be for somebody that maximizes the greatest good for the greatest number. And he was saying, you all, he was sort of scolding the rest of us. Uh, he's just saying, ethics demands that we all do this and don't privilege your family members. And I, and he even says at one point in some of his lectures, like, my family didn't really like this. It just seems <laughs> obvious. Um, but then I discovered that he had already, before he had went on this great philanthropy a tour, uh, he had provisioned his kids, you know, uh, significantly with income and an inheritance. And they were, they were all going to like Ivy League schools and they were fine. They were going to be fine. So it's one thing for people to preach to us about discounting our loyalty bonds and that we should be acting for the good of strangers. Um, and then to find that they're hypocritically provisioning their own family first. I, again, I find this more human. It, it sort of humanizes them, but then shut up about why we all have to just help the strangers and not our own first. I think we live in a culture that's very uh, hostile to nepotism, doesn't know what to do with nepotism, as you said, and then turns around and each one of us enacts it, practices it, benefits from it. I, I feel like we need to be more realistic about that and come to terms with it. And I, I look at the Chinese example as a kind of radical alternative, because if you look at Chinese culture, which is based on Confucianism, that filial devotion is the most, you know, it's a concentric circle. So that's the middle circle. It's you and your nuclear family. And your dedication to them then scales out and up to the larger society with, you know, varying degrees of success. I, I asked my students, because I was teaching in uh, Beijing a few years ago, and I, I asked my American students and my Chinese students the same question. It was a thought experiment. I said, uh, you know, if, if somebody comes to your door and says, hey, uh, it's your friend, and they're like, hey, I might have uh, hurt somebody, and it looks like the police are after me. Can you just mm -hmm. shelter me in your basement for a little while? I asked the students, you know, how many of you would shelter your friend? American and Chinese students say, yeah, I, I would do that. You know, I would hide them in my basement. Then I start playing with the thought experiment. And I said, okay, they come to your door and they have blood all over them, you know, and they, you know, this is more dramatic and you can see police flashlights coming. And now the American students start backing out and saying, well, no, I don't, I don't think I would do that. And Chinese students hang in there. No, they, I hide them in the basement and I keep mm -hmm. like ratcheting it up to like more and more dramatic crimes. Chinese students never give up their friend for any reason, like I, I could just come, like you discover they're a serial killer, you know, mm -hmm. it's just in the, it's in the culture that you always prefer your uh, kith and kin over larger scale society values and norms. Whereas Americans will, will quickly shift over to that other ethic after just a little bit of pressure. And I find that fascinating. But what are we giving up when we go down that road? Cause I mean, I think a lot of utilitarians would say, well, this is, this is progress, right? In other words, the flattening of the, the flattening of the, of the slope, right? As we kind of go from those small circles to the broader circles, like that's, that's a sign of human progress, right? And the fact that you would prosecute your father, right? <laughs> or, yeah. um, if they committed a crime, right? That, that, that's seen as, that's seen as a virtue in sort of the, the American world. Um, are, are we giving something up? And, and when I say, are we giving something up? I mean, that obviously has some kind of normative implications and, and you, you do talk a bit about kind of health versus truth, right? And presumably here also you would kind of think about the impact on human flourishing. Is, is there something that we give up when we sort of dissolve those familial ties, dissolve those ties of, of friendship and begin to kind of treat everybody Similarly, I, I I do think we we give up uh, the most important stuff. That's my own view, and I think we're seeing it happen in society too. There's a lot of critique uh, around social media and the fracturing and alienation of young people in particular, but everybody. And there seems to be a lot of evidence that um, people would have reported like a handful of, there, there's done, there's been a lot of social science work on this in the last, I would say, uh, 30 or 40 years, people reported having a small number of devoted friends 
And as the decades tick on to the present, the number of friends they have dwindles down to first it was like four, and then we're talking about three, two, and some people are reporting they have no friends, young people. But at the same time, they'll, they'll, they'll say they have thousands of <laughs> right. friends, Facebook friends, right. right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess my own view is I'm skeptical that that's real friendship. Um, and what I think is that they don't know what real friendship is because and this goes back to our earlier point about the embodiment of the of the mind and about the things that and, our, and values because the way i think you make friends is you you actually uh, engage in activities with them you you have to sort of share in you know think about sort of paradigms of friendship where kids go to camp together and they do these things that are fairly meaningless but they do them together and this forges uh, now you scale that up to like a band of brothers in the military who have to do things that are very high stakes together. It's the kind of embodied activity together that produces all of the sort of uh, endorphins, internal opioids, uh, oxytocin, all of that stuff that bonds people together so that they'll make sacrifices for each other. And I think you don't get much of that gaming together on your console. Um, you know, I've watched my fun, my son sort of grow up in this world where he plays online and his idea of a friendship there, I was worried about him when he was young because I thought that's not, a friend. that's not a friend. He didn't know their names. He didn't know where they were from. He didn't know what they looked like. He hadn't really done anything with them. Um, so I'm happy to say that kids are still capable of getting friendships in school and in all kinds of clubs and pre and post COVID, there's all kinds of opportunities for kids to make real friendships. But I do think we're living more and more the utilitarian dream where people are in less tight bonds and more um, sort of neutral, attenuated bonds. And as a result of that, you're finding more, I believe you're finding more depression, you're finding um, uh, more social problems. And I think, um, I just one last point on this, and then I'll, I'll stop for a second. But, uh, you know, I'm very influenced by Huxley, who, uh, who I'm sorry, um, by uh, um, uh, Orwell, who uh, was reading Gandhi's uh, autobiography. And, and Gandhi said, you know, you should never have any really close friends because that's going to take away your time and prevent you from loving as many people as you can equally which is in a more neutral way. And Huxley, um, I'm sorry, uh, Orwell read this and he did a review of, uh, of, his, of uh, Gandhi's uh, autobiography. And uh, Orwell thought that, that um, Gandhi had given up something about being human and mm -hmm. that part of being human were bonds that were so strong um, that you were willing to, to kill and die for them, which I know sounds dramatic, especially to our modern ear, but that's what he said makes you human. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on that side of the line. Well, I mean, politicians will often have these kind of embarrassing friends or, or siblings, right? I think right. you describe in, in the book a couple of examples of this where, you know, when you're a public figure, um, if you kind of drag your, your brother along, that's great if your brother is Bobby Kennedy. But if, you're, if your brother is, uh, you know, Billy Carter, you know, then you got to... <laughs> you gotta gotta cut them loose at, at some point right uh i mean it's certainly in our world maybe not in, in other parts of the world but certainly in the united states if you have a an embarrassing friend or or brother you know you you can't first of all you can't appoint them to a significant position but you may not even be able to you know associate with them in your duty as a, as a public official yeah i i think i mean i understand it i think it's a bit sad I, i'm not are i mean it's tricky because I'm pro sort of meritocracy on the one hand, uh, you, you know, Billy uh, Carter or, uh, you know, shouldn't get a job that uh, he's not qualified for. On the other hand, if the work needs to get done and your brother can do it, why not your brother? And so nepotism flourishes in politics. It flourishes in Hollywood. My God, like just look at Hollywood. It's loaded with and I believe it flourishes in. I mean, you probably know this figure uh, and I don't, but some fairly high degree of American businesses are family run businesses. Mm -hmm. So nepotism is alive and well and thriving. It's just, we don't want to look at it. <laughs> we don't want to acknowledge mm -hmm. it. We don't want to have a theory about it. And, um, so I, I agree with the idea that you can't have an incompetent person doing the job just because it's your brother. 
On the other hand, that's fairly rare. Um, and um, I think we intuitively understand that sometimes you have to sort of, okay, you're not going to get the job. And if it's going to cause a rift between us, it's going to cause a rift. I don't believe you have to be loyal in all cases when it's, you know, it's basically going to destroy you and your family. Mm -hmm. It has to be done in a way that's that is what the Greeks would have called by phronesis or practical wisdom. You don't have a rule. You don't, you can't look it up and go, well, yeah, he's achieved this many hedons. So the calculus suggests that he's got to go out of the job. It's really more like how a judge makes a, a sentencing decision. You know, um, you, you, you just do it according to practical wisdom. But when you were, you were describing the emergence of this, this norm, right. Against um, nepotism, uh, one thing that, that you left out, I thought, was the 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 role of the law here. Because, look, if I if I own a restaurant, you use the example of someone who owns a bar restaurant, and you know you bring in your brother's band to to play, right? Well, yes, okay. So there are other musicians that don't get the job as a result, but you know you're also going to probably pay the price in having a smaller gate, right? And so, yeah. but if you decide to sacrifice that gate in service of your brother, that's fine. But if you're managing somebody else's money, right? So mm -hmm. in, in, in the Anglo American world, right? We've been, we've had these legal structures for over a thousand years where, you know, I entrust you to manage my money. And if I entrust you to manage my money and you hire your brother, you know, that comes out of my pocket, not, not out of your pocket. And so, so that's why we have in place these, um, you know, conflict of, of interest, duty of loyalty and, and so forth, right. In the, in the law. And, and I think, you know, governmentally, our governments have been just built on those kind of legal principles mm -hmm. where it's, it's really all about agency, right? No, I think that's right. And I, my project is not to dismantle that or get rid of it. It, right. it has made, you know, the West great in many ways. Um, and I appreciate it. I guess what I think is interesting is that we're taking, uh, just like we were saying earlier about the mind itself as having these layers and we're sort of focusing an AI on the computational mind. Here, I think we're looking at the legal framework, which, as I say, I'm a fan of, and we're trying to basically overlay it across all, all of ethics and normativity in general. And that's where I think the mistake lies. So, um, Yes, I believe uh, the law should be blindfolded. Um, on the other hand, if you try to bring that into your personal relationships or like a non-government situation or like you said, when you have um, investment situations, then I don't think it works as well. Um, and well what I, guess... I did find interesting was the way you characterized it, as you said, look, if, if, I, if I were to hire my brother for this role, you, you know, everyone would agree that that's a, a, a breach of some duty of, of fairness. But if I didn't hire my brother, m most people would not see that as a breach of, you know, fraternal duty, which, which of course it is in, it in is, some yeah. sense. Right. Um, so right. we're basically failing to acknowledge the, the, the trade-off, right. But there's clearly a trade-off between there these competing a, norms. Yeah. There's a huge trade-off. And I think the, the story we've told ourselves, like sort of from Hegel on, is that we used to live in these small tribal affiliations, and then we we had progress where we increasingly had larger and larger societies until we live in groups of strangers, and the law has taken over all of those sort of um, normative uh, challenges that we needed before. But I think this is sort of wrong. This is to spread the allegiance uh, across a temporal sweep when in fact it's really a vertical line or, or sort of maybe even like nested Russian dolls where we still live in these small tribal groups in our neighborhoods, in our families, inside the larger ethic of strangers. That, that wasn't a long time ago and we're past it now so we can live in larger societies. We still live in this kind of hierarchy of values and some of them like to observe one duty actually cancels out the other duty and vice versa. And that's the, that's the thing that I'm interested in. And it does seem like it's kind of, um, my own view is that these tribes should be and are based in biology. Like we were saying before, we're, we're mammals. So our affiliation with others actually has a kind of neurochemical substrate 
substrate to it. We're bonded to people through oxytocin and endogenous opioids. That's how. That's why we feel the strong connection with family members. It happens in the actually the maternal care of the baby. Um, what I find people, and so that's where tribes actually happen, is through biology and through shared history. What I find happening now in the conversation, sort of post-Trump, <clears throat> is people are now starting to talk about tribes, which I think is good because we need to. But they're, mm-hmm. again, talking about tribes uh, up here, like they're talking about like Twitter tribes, tribes of ideology and saying like, oh, you know, this is, isn't this terrible? Um we got to get rid of tribalism. Tribalism is so bad. It's so evil. It's terrible. But but I, you can't get rid of the, the tribes I'm talking about, which are your biological roots. If you want to say, yes, ideology needs to, we should, we should give up on our ideological tribes and loosen up some of our sort of political, uh, social commitments, I, I agree. That is a problem. But I'm afraid that now all the talk about tribes is, is that, it, again, it's just negative. It doesn't help you. It's just a, a hindrance to pure ethical harmony. And I think that's, again, we're making the same mistake we've always made. Well, I mean, clearly tribalism has its costs, right? So if, if I'm going to give yeah. preferential um, access or and one, one of the tribes that you, you, you didn't mention in, in the book was uh, university tribes, right? A lot of us in the elites, you know, think, oh yeah, I'm, I, I don't, I don't do, I don't do that. I don't do, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not tribal, but, but then at the universities, we, 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 we recruit people and yeah. our key, the key to our value proposition, like the thing that, that the reason why you want to come to Stanford, right? The reason why you want to come to a university is because you're going to get preferential access to the network, right? That's right. I mean, if, if, if someone from Berkeley calls me and says, Hey, can you take a look at my pitch deck? I mean, I'm, I'm going to do it. And right. if somebody from, you know, Columbia college calls me, I'm going to be like, no, I'm busy. Like, leave me alone. Right. And so we, we do this, we, we brag about it. We, we advertise it. Right. But we, we don't see it as a form of, of, of nepotism, but in fact, that's really what it is. Right. And doesn't I, it necessarily it is, yes. come at the expense of the people who don't, you know, they're not a part of this network. I totally agree. And I think unlike a lot of people who would then scold you for your uh, hypocrisy, um, I want us to just admit that we're doing this and then find a way to work it into our notion of the good. I I don't claim to have this solved or figured out exactly, but um, it does no good to just live in double consciousness, you know, of hypocrisy all the time. And I think you're right. Uh, the university is in large part a nepotism system, as are all these other sort of connection systems that we have. Religion, it's sort of, you know, religion used to be a major form of what what we would call, you know, an anthropology kind of creating fictive kin, where you had, yeah. you know, blood ties uh, that were obvious. And most of the people you would be devoted to would be people in your day to day, you know, life. Then as society got larger and you ended up having, you know, you rubbing shoulders with strangers, we had, we needed a system to build kin of some kind, like, um, Christianity, for example, you know, if you see the original, um, sort of schools of, of, you know, coming out of the Jesus of Nazareth cult at the time, it would have been seen as basically a kind of millennial form of Judaism. Then Paul comes along and goes, Hey, you know what? Uh, You don't have to, you don't have to get circumcised to be a Christian. You get circumcised in the heart. That's what we mean. It's a symbolic circumcision. (laughs) Boom. All of a sudden your tribe is way bigger and you, he goes all around the Mediterranean gathering people in. And this is a way in which, uh, religions and Buddhism did the exact same thing, by the way, by critiquing the caste system, you can create brotherhood, brethren, sororities, sisterhoods, um, through, um, a mutual devotion to Jesus or the Buddha or whatever. And then it's actually practical because let's say you're a businessman and you've got to go from one town to another, you know, mm-hmm. in around the Mediterranean and you need a place to sleep. Oh, they're, they're Christians. Okay. I can, you know, it really becomes part of the economic relationship uh, and how groups create the solidarity. We're still doing this today. And to sort of call all this nepotism and just rule it out, as being corrupt, I think is just very, is just poor. Uh, it, it shows an anemic kind of ethical thinking mm-hmm. that we're well, all I remember hearing this talk. I remember hearing this, this, uh, this talk by this, this guy who, um, 
I don't, I don't know how famous he is, but he was apparently shot on the evening of 9-11. He worked at a gas station and uh, he was Pakistani. And so somebody it was in Texas. I think some guy came in and, and you know, shot him and, and the guy got convicted and he, he was shut up at the trial and said, advocated for uh, mercy, you know, and said, this guy should be uh, forgiven for, for what he did. Cause you know, you can't, you can't really blame him. But, but the backstory was that this guy was Pakistani and he, um, you know, showed up in America and uh, his cousin who owned a gas station was like, all right, you know, you can sleep on the floor while you study for your accounting mm -hmm. degree and work at the, at the, you know, the gas station. Um, and he said that, you know, there were these, uh, there were these, these American employees who worked at the same gas station who, who didn't even have anybody to pick them up at the end of their shift. Yeah. Right. And, and these were like, you know, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th generation Americans. And they had no, they had no kin. They had no, no network, no, no support systems. Right. Whereas the, you know, the, the, the Pakistanis, they, they show up and, you know, you find a random Pakistani, yeah. <laughs> and they don't, maybe they're not even a cousin, but, but there's that, that solidarity. That's right. Because of those, the, the ethnic ties. And, and, and I guess, you know, there's that, that strength associated with those kind of ethnic ties, but, but, but I mean, those ethnic ties can also be very harmful, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, can we, you know, if you think about the classification in today's world of people into these, uh, you know, racial categories, for instance, I mean, sh should we be thinking more carefully about, look, we, we can't get rid of these, uh, these fake kin that there's going to be a need for them, but can we, can we engineer them in ways that are kind of less, less harmful, less divisive? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think, um, there is, there are good and bad tribes and better and worse tribes. And my view is not in any way a defense of, you know, racism or sexism or the kind of ethnic cleansing model that you find in the pernicious forms of tribalism. Um, and so we've been talking up until this point about just relatively either benign or helpful uh, tribes. And I think whenever I talk to immigrant groups or friends who are immigrants, they get this point right away that you were saying. And, and I grew up uh, in this town, Waukegan, where there's a huge nepotistic system between Mexico and Waukegan and everyone helps each other to get through yeah. life. Um, but I think you're right. We need to, and thankfully, um, psychology suggests that there are ways to easily change people's tribal affiliations. And if we just had a kind of educational system and um, greater awareness about this, it might help us create uh, more healthy, flourishing tribes versus the negative ones. So, for example, um, some social science uh, research um, looked at uh, affiliation in that can be very trivial, like who's your favorite uh, sports team? Yeah. And that, that stuff can get very tribal, as you know, like people can actually hurt each other over teams. But with the right kind of massaging, you can get people to switch allegiances. People, mm -hmm. um, their allegiance can even be as as sort of um, malleable as, I remember reading one study where they said, uh, you know, they have a big room full of people and if they can find some people whose birthday was the same or on the same yeah. date, they'll feel a strange connection and solidarity and want to help each other out. So, th so the hu human psychology is, you know, as ugly as it is, it can also be massaged. And I think it's the work of culture to massage it in the right direction, in a humanizing rather than a dehumanizing way. And we have a lot of research. I know we don't learn from history very well, but one of my other major interests is in um, sort of cultures of, of monstrosity and demonization. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that it's very easy to demonize a group that you don't like or that you're going to go to war with. Historically, it would be we're going to have competition for resources, so I'm going to treat those as non-humans, and then we can feel justified in, in attacking them. Uh, but but um, you can form healthier uh, tribes. The question, though, that's really kind of disturbing is, are the best tribes the ones that have a common enemy? And in that mm -hmm. case, the, the question is like, who, who's the common enemy? And could you, you hear this kind of stuff in sci-fi circles all the time where people will say, well, you know, we will, we'll stop killing each other when we have, you know, aliens to, to fight or to be, you know, collectively opposed to. So the us-them mm -hmm. dynamic is, is real, but the them is something that's malleable and can change. 
So, so are you saying that the, the strength of the tie or the usefulness of the tie does not depend on having a common enemy or the, at least the, the violent tendencies towards the common enemy need not be correlated with the strength of, of the tie? I mean, if I think about sports, I mean, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia and uh, the, you know, if somebody shows up with a Dallas Cowboys jacket to the stadium, you know, they would they would not emerge unscathed. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And that, that same thing was true, I think, for English soccer uh, back in, in the day. And, and you know, those things have have mellowed out somewhat. And so there's there's less kind of inter-tribal uh, violence. Does, does that mean necessarily that, that the ties are, are, are weaker uh, in, in some way? Or, or can you, you know, can you keep the ties strong w- w- while at the same time have a healthy amount of, of benign respect for the competing tribes? I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, there are, I there's think some law of thermodynamics that, that yeah. you know, says that, you know, because you, 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 I think you seem to be arguing that it's, it's, it's a win-win, right? You can have pro social and, and, you know, pro group sentiment without necessarily um, imposing any kind of harm on, on the out group. No, I, I, if I came across, that's too optimistic for my view. Uh, I am, uh, I do think it's a zero sum game. Uh, and I do think that the benefits of in some tribal situation is the detriment of another group. I do think there's a huge range though of stakes involved. So in the case of sports, unless you're like really, you're drunk or you're kind of psychopathic, you're not going to kill somebody because you're, their, their team beat your team. The stakes are low, and most people recognize that. The same is true in music. Like, are you a Beatles fan or a Rolling Stones well, there, fan? There was a, there was a war uh, in, uh, between El Salvador and, uh, um, and Honduras at one point <laughs> over a soccer match, I believe. Okay, so let's. I would still consider that to be a kind of fringe example, but uh, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe you can ramp. Here, I guess here's what I would say is um, in the in the scale of stakes, uh, the question is, what are what's the resource competition um, when you have real resource competition? Like my family is actually not going to eat tonight mm-hmm. uh, because of the what these guys did over here. That's a very high stakes resource problem. Whereas I think of a sports competition as nothing like that. And if it is like that, it's probably masking one of these high stakes situations. Um, you know, there's lots of cases where you think, for example, of the Hutus and the Tutsis in the 90s, you know, killing each other with machetes. And it looked like it was a fairly ideological um, process of us and them. And the the Hutus had been sort of suppressed for a very long time, and the Tutsis had sort of been together with imperial power. And this was sort of revenge time in the 90s. And so, uh, but anthropologists who've looked at that case more closely uh, say, well, you know, part of this problem has a lot to do with the incredible overpopulation and very small resources of the people of Rwanda. And the argument they've made, which I find persuasive, is that nothing like this would have happened in Botswana, for example, which has huge, you know, areas of land and smaller population. So I do think a lot of this, these tribal tensions are are masking uh, an economic and survival problem that's under the surface. So if you can address that, I mean, here's a, here's a great example. Um, bonobos, I, I think you probably know, are, are very sort of famous for being like the hippie chimps. You know, they're always making love, not war. They're always having sex with each other. Whenever there's like a, any sort of conflict, they start engaging in sexual activity. Chimps, on the other hand, are extremely violent and they're very tribal and the, the, the tribal connections, it it always ends in bloodshed. But if you look at chimps and bonobos, uh, who are some of our closest relatives, you find that in the case of bonobos, they mostly eat fruit and it's plentiful. There isn't a huge competition for food. Um, Whereas chimps are in a very high conflict competition for food and resources, and they use meat as a kind of sexual currency. So that produces a very different kind of um, effect with regard to tribalism. So, so I guess I would say my view is you can't eliminate all uh, us, them um, 
t tensions and, the, you know, it's a zero sum game, but some of them are more dramatic than others. And if we could address some of those underlying causes, we would end up having healthier tribes uh, in the long run. Now, in the book Against Fairness, you, you, you argue that fairness has become sort of a, a catch all um, moral value, which really is about much more than than fairness, right? And I think it's kind of like fairness is has kind of replaced the notion of the good, right? So anything yeah. that we value in American society, we kind of attribute it to, to fairness. Uh, but that, you know, a lot of the things that you, people are advocating have nothing to do with, with fairness. They're really more about kind of charity and, and so forth. And the kind of misunderstanding fairness leads to all sorts of perverse outcomes. You, you describe how, I think, when your son came home with a with, with a ribbon, right, a participation ribbon, and this kind of this kind of disturbed you. Could 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 you talk a bit about like how is this how has fairness become the 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 substitute for the good now? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a really a timely issue because um, we do use fairness in all these ways, and if you look at conservatives and and uh, liberals, they're actually talking about two different things with fairness. I yeah. think the the conservative view views fairness as, um, you know, the as a kind of meritocracy. The person who actually won deserves the desserts of that victory. The person who worked harder gets the gets the uh, the results. Um, whereas I think on the left, fairness has been has been thought increasingly thought of as a kind of equal outcomes, where everyone gets the same instead of equal opportunity. It's equal outcomes, and. So yeah, my son came home with a, a ribbon and uh, he said he won the race. This is when he was like in third grade or something. I said, oh my God, I didn't even know you were, I, I didn't know you were fast. He didn't seem particularly fast to me. And he said, no, no, I, I, I didn't come in first place. We all won the race, you know, and he, he sort of held the, uh, the ribbon to me as a refutation of my skepticism. And, um, and I said, no, I, I just, you know, I said, yeah, you didn't win the race. Uh, they gave you this for participating, but let me tell you something. And then I proceeded to be this sort of. Um, sort of, I'm trying to prepare my son to be ready for the real world. So I don't want him to think like he's going to get a ribbon every time he tries something. Um, I do think that many people talk about things like generosity, um, and patience and, uh, things like justice using the only language they know, which is fairness. So, um, when you look at the curriculum, as I was doing when I was writing that book, because I was my son went to Ch Chicago Public School, so I got to look at okay, what's a public school education like for a kid nowadays? And it got increasingly um, more, tilted more and more away from meritocracy. In fact, he was not allowed to bring Valentines to one or two kids mm -hmm. unless he brought Valentines for all the kids. So there would be no demonstration of allegiance or loyalty or favoritism because that's evil. And instead, everyone would have to get a vi And I, I thought, well, this actually violates the meaning of, 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 a, of a Valentine <laughs> um, because you're picking this person out as your favorite and making some demonstration of your allegiance to them. And But that's the culture we're living in. It's become increasingly tilted towards um, everyone should have the same. And if there's any... Um, sort of uh, difference between outcomes, the suggestion now is that it must be the result of some discrimination, either at the institutional or at the personal level. And that's fairly new. Um, I don't think that's doing uh, kids a, a, a service. I think that um, that's probably creating a generation of uh, very entitled people who feel uh, very much like if they don't get what they want or if someone has more than them, then it's um, something they can use the state or an institution to punish. And I, I admit that the impulse is human. Everybody feels this way. In fact, it's more than human. Uh, there's some great work by primatologist Franz Duval De on how even monkeys have this kind of uh, envy. If they see someone next to them in the, you know, in the next uh, cage over getting some, you know, a grape instead of a piece of cucumber, they freak out and they throw, they have a little tantrum. So I'm not saying it isn't human or it isn't mammal, but we need uh, cultural educational forms to try to, to, to help train us to, you know, that's why I think there's kind of a backlash against all this um, 
which is there like their stoicism is sort of on the rise mm -hmm. people are there's a sort of a new appreciation of marcus aurelius and seneca and epictetus saying you know what life is like that life isn't fair so you better develop some psychological technologies some t psychological tendencies that help you handle the unfairness that happens that's going to happen to all human beings and that's i think a, a good way to also prepare your kids well, you also point to religion as a as a tool for emotional regulation, right? And that you say that, you know religion has has evolved uh, alongside our other capacities and is an important tool for helping us to engage the world. And and so you really emphasize the the value of religion, the utility of of religion for psychological uh, health. And and I guess in in the book, you know, why we need religion. Um, one question I was I came out of that book with was, is 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 religion as you define it sort of on the decline, right? Or have we kind of substituted our traditional religions with sort of a, a, a new a new type of religion to some degree? I mean, have the, the stories of the Bible been replaced by the stories of you know sitcoms and um, you know genre fiction and you know whatever? Yeah, like, right. is is there is is does it make sense to talk about the disappearance of religion or is there sort of a a, a, a constant level of, of religiosity but it's just kind of disguised by the the rhetoric of of rationality yeah i think it's the latter um that the religious impulse i believe is the is both the social impulse and also the need the way in which culture created abilities to to do effective emotional emotional management and i do think you can get that via other uh, domains like the artistic like you said you know one of the one sort, sort of popular thesis is that uh religion you know nietzsche's famous you know god is dead religion just doesn't have the same force it has in culture that it did pre-19th century and so many people have suggested that art has taken its place so people find inspiration in poetry and music and paintings and um, emotional management in storytelling and art and i agree with all of that i think the component that's that also has to be continued if we're going to be a post-religious age um, is that uh, is the social bonding of social activity together, which religion did very well. Um, and religion, so I'm, I'm sort of pro-religion. I wrote a book called Why We Need Religion. So I'm just following up on your own sort of suggestion. Well, what's what's like, interesting about that book is the way, you start, the way you started the book is you described a story that happened in, in the classroom. And from that, I gathered that that, that I gathered that, that story happened fairly, you know, later in your career, but it seems like everything that you've been doing throughout your whole career, you know, pretty much led to that moment because it seemed implicit in everything that you were doing before. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, the, the, the story is that I was, I was at a, a college on the East Coast and I was giving lectures. You know, sometimes you go and you spend like a couple of days and you, you do lectures and it's great because you meet other faculty, but also students come into the lunches and classes and you interact with them. And, and this kid, came, I had been I had been making fun of the Creation Museum in Kentucky, I think, and then using this as a sort of broad sort of cudgel against religion because I was, I was a fair, fairly skeptical early in my career. And this kid came to me uh, afterwards and he related the story saying that his he himself was not particularly religious, but his brother, he and his brother and another sibling, so three siblings, were being raised by a single mother and his brother had been horrifically murdered um like five years before and that th this had caused his mother quite understandably to go into a complete tailspin and uh, she just couldn't get out of bed the depression was just debilitating she couldn't function anymore and he said that um it was religion that d slowly drew her back to the world and i began to see that it wasn't like oh it made her feel better and that was it i be he the way he described it, I began to see like it actually put her on her feet, helped her get food. She had two other siblings to take care of. It's not, it's not like your job's over. Okay, I feel terrible. Kids, do your best. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all like this. We're all enmeshed and in a kind of network of these deep family ties, which are also 
honestly, their, their nervous system ties. Like when your child hurts, you hurt. They are really extended nervous systems. And I began to see that like even ideas that I had, had previously made fun of, um, I had been raised a Catholic and I was a lapsed Catholic. I began to see, oh, these ideas are highly therapeutic. Uh, whether or not they're true or false. And what does that mean? It's not trivial. Uh, I think it was Roger Scruton who said, um, the, uh, the consolation that comes from imaginary things is not imaginary consolation. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it's true or false. The flourishing of the organism and the, the family unit could be really uh, ad, ad, ad enhanced. And in this case, the, the mother thought, well, you know, churchgoers started to come and bring her food and bring her back to church. And so she got the social connection and the oxytocin, the internal opioids. She began to think about her son's body. He, was, he had been stabbed to death. And she began to think about her son's body as intact and that she would embrace it in the afterlife. These are deeply consoling forms of imagination. And this also led me down the road of thinking more about the imagination as not just how we ordinarily think of it as just like, oh, it's fantasy or fancy, you know, it's distracting. It's, you know, Walt Disney. No, the imagination, I think like Blake, like William Blake thought, or even Edmund Burke uh, with the notion of the moral imagination, it's a huge force for values, for how we conceive of the good, for how we live our life. And I think religion is just really one of the best uh, time-tested um, cultural institutions that helps cultivate, uh, you know, an imagination that tends towards the flourishing of the individuals and as, and of the group. But that, doesn't that mean you have but to kind of turn in your, your too. don't you have to turn in your philosopher card at this point? Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses and, and that's a good thing. Right. And therefore, yeah, you right. know, you that's guys, you know, go out and go out and get religion. I mean, you're advocating the, 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 the pursuit of the therapeutic, um, but, but as a philosopher, you're, you're not supposed to care, right? You're not supposed to care whether something's good for you or bad for you. You're supposed to care about whether it's, it's true or false. Right. And, 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 you know, it's clear that there, there weren't, you know, I, I love that story about when you went to the, the, the creationist museum and, 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 and that how they rationalized all the different animals on the ark and so forth. Right. And, um, I mean, are, are, how did you resist the temptation to say, look, th th this is not going to work, right? You know, you can't have 40 million species on this, uh, on this arc. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was tricky because I, I had to retain a kind of composure. I talked to the, the head of the creation museum, Ken Ham. And, um, but I, I really do believe in, I'm not sort of a, even when I interviewed him, I was considered myself an atheist or agnostic, but I'm not sort of of the Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris variety where I just think, or Dawkins, where I just think you're just stupid. I don't think that's, that's the case at all. I think many religious people are very smart, very devoted. And what I saw in him was also something really interesting, which was yeah, he was using sort of science from the, from the 1700s, basically, and a kind of, but he was using logic that you and I would recognize. He's just starting from radically different first principles than a secular society would start from. And what I noticed was it was getting him great successes in the domain of social um, uh, social life. He's a hero in a community mm -hmm. that, you know, New Yorkers, Californians, Chicagoans don't, don't care about, but I can assure you in Kentucky, he's a big wheel. And he's, uh, if you think about beliefs as an extension of the survival, um, instinct and that what you're trying to do with beliefs is not get them true, but get maximum grip on reality, which is what I think, because I'm a pragmatist, uh, then this guy's doing a pretty bang up job in a different kind of context than, than you and I live in. Uh, so I, I, it's true. A lot of philosophers would make me want, give up the philosophy card, but you know, there's a, the American tradition is William James, John Dewey. These people are the ones that I tend to agree with. They, they would have said, oh, your God's eye view of truth, get out of here with that. That's a pipe dream. What really truth is what works and uh, what works has to be understood in down in the nitty gritty of things. What's happening in the individual, what's happening in the community. But I, but I think, um, 
you know, for many of us, and, and I think Stephen Jay Gould is someone who articulated this well, right? You know, you've got the domain of science, which is over here, which is, covers the, you know, indicative. And then you get this other realm, which is, you know, the imperative, which has nothing to do with, with, with science, you know, it comes from somewhere else. But, but you're arguing that, you know, religion necessarily will have elements of, of, of both. And so for those who are trying to kind of maintain this Chinese wall between the, you know, the positive and the normative, the is and the ought, that, that ultimately it's, 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 a, it's an exercise that will break down at some point. I, I think that's, that's ex exactly right. And I think we should recognize that, like, when I, you know, the imperative is, is something that if you think about language, it has an indicative, which is, okay, that there's a dog. But then the imperative is like, there's a dog, you know, and I'm, I'm afraid of dogs and it's coming at me. Um, our language is actually both, uh, as you were pointing out, it's both indicative and imperative. Um, and for most animals, the world is imperative. They see the world not as a description of the world. Like your dog doesn't think I got a good, pretty good model of the downstairs or the outside. Mm -hmm. um, it sees the world in what psychologists call affordances. So, you know, the, it doesn't have a theory or a taxonomy of cups, but it does have a sense that this can be, you can drink out of this. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think about symbols in religion, if you go from just regular language to things like a religion, it, you see that there are very powerful images like Christ on the cross. That's not like just a guy, you know, nailed to a cross. It comes loaded with imperative meaning. So somebody sees this and they feel uh, a whole bunch of emotions, fear, sadness, inspiration. And in religion, too, this is what we're doing is we're telling stories. I was an altar boy. I heard the priest. At, I served at many funerals and the priest would tell these consoling stories that were very hard to believe, like at the indicative level, but that's the, the grieving family is at, at the imperative level and they need some kind of um, assuaging of that, those terrible emotions. They need to feel consolation in order to then be functional human beings. And I think religion does a really good job with this kind of stuff, not just with the images and the iconography, but the rituals, the ceremony, the big stuff too, like sacraments, like forgiveness, you'll find in most religions that forgiveness is a phenomenal reset button for people who cannot get over like um, a sense of injustice or injury, or, or if they have beef with somebody that they can't, they see no way to get over it. Forgiveness comes in and says, uh, we can reset. We can reset the emotions. Uh, you don't have to be angry all the time. Uh, forgiveness allows a kind of recalibration of the emotions and this is healthy. Yeah. I mean, what I find interesting about your argument is that I think for most of us, we have this view that, um, the story of progress is sort of the emergence of the rational view, which is kind of coming out of the, the, the darkness of, of religion. But I think y your argument is that, that r religion is actually at the heart of this development of the more sophisticated, mental properties that we have. And, and as an example, I mean, you talk about kind of the, the role of, you know, mindfulness training, right. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, rumination and how this helps to, you know, helps us to manage our, our emotions, to manage the, the limbic system. And you say that religion does a better job of, of describing kind of our emotional life than, than science ever could. Um, I mean, I found, I found, I mean, this is a, this is a rather, it's a rather pr provocative statement, right? That, that it's kind of religion that has helped us to um, manage our impulses and manage our um, otherwise kind of animalistic tendencies. Yeah. Look, if you, if you look at um, the, like you mentioned mindfulness and it makes me think about Buddhism. And if you look at, Buddhism and Christianity, Judaism, you'll find that whatever their views about consciousness, and Buddhism can get quite out there and quite bohemian, they generally have a kind of social conservatism. They, they believe that once you're married, you're, you should be loyal to that person, and you really probably shouldn't be having sex before marriage. And we sort of laugh at this and go, isn't that charming, you know, these old ways, you know, we're all past that. But really, think about it. How well would a tribe have survived? if the men and women in that tribe were literally acting on 
their libidinal impulse every time it descended upon them, which would be regularly, you would violate all of the well worked out allegiances that you had forged with. I mean, imagine you basically have a culture where you have to hunt with these five guys and uh, but then you go and sleep with one of their wives. What's the allegiance going to be like after that? In other words, if you think about it just as a survival of a group sort of adaptation, then religion comes along and it helps people to sacrifice their immediate hedonistic drives for something that's higher. Is it true or false? I don't even care. Who cares? Did it help those people to actually live together as a group? I would say in most cases, yes, it does. If you look at mainstream religion, important caveats here, all of the fringe stuff I hate as much as everybody else does. If you think you got to kill somebody because that's what God wants you to do, yeah, I'm not supporting that. That I'm talking about the large, you know, silent majority of religious people that are in the middle, which is of the bell curve. And even though there's ugly stuff that people like Hitchens and Dawkins have pointed out, and I agree with that stuff. Well, I mean, the ugly stuff is the stuff that shows up in, in I think, in, in the media the most, right? I mean, yes. whether it's uh, fanatic Islamic terrorists or yep. um, you, you know, well uh, sexually uh, harassing priests, <laughs> you know, like the, right. it seems like that we, 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 there's a, there's a selection bias in favor of the things that kind of make religion look stupid. Oh, absolutely. Like if you, if maybe not so much now, but 10 years ago, everybody knew about the Westboro Baptist Church. Oh my God, look at these kooks, you know, just nutty, insane. And it was like a, people were holding it up as a model of Christianity. And the Westboro Baptist Church was like 50 members, 50 members. And that was the model of Christianity. It's ridiculous. So people, enemies of religion will cherry pick the worst stuff, like you said, and the media cherry picks the worst stuff because if it bleeds, it leads. So that, but the rest of us, um, and and history will show, I think, that for the most part, religion had a civilizing effect. However, um, it's also very good at ramping up aggression and pointing it at an enemy. So let's not be naive. I just think that the the reason why that happens and when that happens it's n is not arbitrary. The reasons for that can be found, I believe, in most cases in the deeper areas of mind and and anthropology, not at the level of beliefs. Oh, they don't believe with us, so let's let they don't believe with us, so let's go kill them. It's actually masquerading a low, a deeper resource uh, ma uh, struggle and competition. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite stories in in the book was you, you quote H. L. Mencken. Right. Where he, he said, you know, to question a man's religion is to sort of question his belief that his wife is beautiful and his <laughs> children are, are smart. And yeah. and I think you, you, you turn that the intention of that quote on its head somewhat. Right. I think he, he was sort of saying that these are all silly beliefs. But you, I think you're, what you're saying is that these are actually very important <laughs> beliefs. Yeah, right. That's right. And yeah. that, that, you know, you want somebody to have those uh, beliefs, however um, irrational they might be about their spouse and child. And you want yeah. them to also have that same set of capacities with respect to their religion. Yeah, I think that's right. And and it gets at a kind of a, it's kind of an oblique way to appreciate the way in which favoritism doesn't really fit well with either the left or the right, like both the left and the right sort of have a problem with it. The, your wife, you, you think your wife is beautiful because you love her, um, hopefully not the other way around, but it's sometimes yeah, I mean, well, the other if, way if somebody around. Say, if somebody were to say, you know, I love my wife in spite of her ugliness, right? You know, I don't ever confuse fact. And I don't ever right. confuse the, the, the positive and the normative, right? right? You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm super razor sharp. I'm objective. I'm scientific. Yeah. My wife is ugly, but my kid is an idiot, but Hey, I love him anyway. Right. right? I love him anyway. <laughs> not to, not, if someone says that you think, all right, well, this person's not the, the best yeah. parent, right? The, yeah. This person is suspicious for all kinds of reasons. So we, we accept this and it's sort of like this point we were having earlier too, about the imagination. You see your, your love, your wife, your spouse, your husband, or your wife, or you see them through the imagination and it's mm -hmm. not some bullshit layer that you put on top of the objective facts which you already see that's not how it works the objective facts are actually so I, what what's the there's a great phrase that um 
a philosopher said about um, science itself, you don't see facts directly. You put nature on the rack and you torture nature and then you extract the facts. And mm -hmm. that's how I think we actually interact with our social world and our environment world. It's much more imperative. It's much more about loyalty and the imagination and our value systems. We're already in an affective community. Our family is our first affective or emotional community. So for you to then come with a kind of scientific, indicative, utilitarian calculus, I just think you can't get there from here. That's just not going not gonna to work. <clears throat> well, look, we, we barely scratched the surface of your work, but I, I can't let you go before asking you. In, in the book, um, uh, The Evolution of Imagination, you, you hold up this whole idea of kind of Im improvisation as a sort of an ideal. I mean, not just for the, the creative life, but I think for uh, kind of life in, in general. And, and, and I, I was wondering, I think it was in um, one of the other books, you, you used this quote from um, Deng Xiaoping, right? About kind of feeling the stones w with your feet. And, and I think that was meant to describe kind of practical wisdom or phronesis or, you know, there's no single algorithm that will help you to, navigate life, right? But that you have these, these competing obligations that you have to somehow, you know, manage in, in a contextual way is, is improvisation like jazz improvisation. Is, is that, a, is that, can we, should we think of that as a metaphor for, for, for navigating life in, in general? And should we sort of esteem people who are particularly good at engaging in this kind of improvisation? And should we therefore, I guess, think some, something less of the people who are, you know, just playing from the printed sheet music and not <laughs> adding any kind of uh, flexibility into their, to their performance. I, I would part with you just at the end, you know, um, because uh, there are things that I think our culture should prize the improviser more than it does. Absolutely. For the reasons mm -hmm. you were just suggesting, because it's how we actually survive in the world effectively. It, it, it creates innovation. And having lived in the West and in China for quite a bit, you begin to see the differences between a culture that prizes innovation and one that prizes a kind of rote memorization and testing. Um, yeah, I was, I was interviewing actually Ellen Winter recently, who is um, a psychologist of art. And, and she was comparing, actually, she went to China and saw how they teach art, which is very much about kind of rote reproduction of yeah. the you know, the work that's in front of them. And, and they even have a formula like, okay, if you're gonna do a bird, a bird is two circles, right? Yep. And then, and, and everybody, and if you, if you get help from your parents to do it, that's, that's actually a good thing. And then yeah. in, in the West, we're like, no, no, you have to, you know, you have to kind of use your imagination, right? To, to create this, this, this bird. Um, no, it's true. And the, the, there's a, they even they try they realize that it's a problem because you'll you'll see even in their business uh, writings and their in the philosophy they do let's say like I remember reading um, and I included it in the evolution of imagination one guy was saying uh, where's our Bill Gates you know where's our Steve Jobs and they so sometimes the 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 public institutions will try to create an opportunity for imagination or improvisation to happen. But it's just like you said, when you actually look at what they're doing, they're memorizing Tang dynasty poems, and then the kid has to give the poem back. So it's completely so, but having said all that, I just, my son and I just went, uh, he goes to, um, university of Illinois, Champaign, Urbana. And we went to a concert there in which they performed a box, um, the Passion of St. Matthew, which is like three hours long, staggeringly beautiful, absolutely stunning. There's no way you can do that by improvising. Mm -hmm. They executed something that was of such exquisite aesthetic and even, I would argue, moral power, but they did it by reading the sheet music and performing it with emotion. So I don't think, you know, it's like improvisers are better than, than readers. Uh, but it is the case that we need both. And I think the mind is divided like this too. So there's a part of your mind called the default mode network, which is sort of like an improviser. Mm -hmm. and then, But then you need like an editor, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has to say like, well, this is a stupid idea. This is stupid, stupid, stupid. Oh, this is a good one. Let's keep mm -hmm. going with this one. And so I think art and music is a combination of these parts of the mind and parts of culture. We, we need both of them. Right. 
Well, I think we barely scratched the surface. Uh, we began to touch on some of the things in the emotional mind, but um, we'll have to save that for another day. Stephen, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate uh, you spending the time, and it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, a great pleasure. Thank you, Greg. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.